Hello and welcome to Forward Boldly. I'm your host, Christine Niles. St. Joseph is often referred to as the silent saint. And that's because we don't hear a word spoken from him in scripture. There are things written about him. We don't actually hear from St. Joseph himself. Did you know, however, that he is the most powerful intercessor in heaven after Our Lady? I actually didn't know that until I read this book, Consecration of St. Joseph, The Wonders of Our Spiritual Father, authored by Father Donald Calloway. This is a tremendous book. I encourage everyone viewing this, go out, get the book, and do the consecration. Men and women alike, it will change your life. Now, I already had a great devotion to St. Joseph before I ever read this book, but after reading this, all the insights, uh, it just opened my eyes to so many aspects of St. Joseph's masculinity, his fatherhood, how he was as a husband, and just as a man in general. There's so much that we can learn from St. Joseph, men and women alike, but especially the men. I encourage every man, get out, go out, get this book, do the consecration. It will change your life. But today I'm honored to have with me on my show the author of this book, Father Donald Calloway. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, no, it's an honor to be on your show. I I, I see it pop up and I, I watch it when it comes up. So to be a guest, I'm, I'm honored. Thank you. Thanks, Father. And you and I actually have something in common that you may not be aware of. I know that, I mean, for one, you have an amazing conversion story. I mean, everybody watching this, you need to go listen to Father's conversion story. You can find it on YouTube, but it's absolutely amazing. I know that one of the things that you did before, I don't know if you still do this, but do you still surf? I do. Yeah, when I can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what part of California are you in? San Diego. Yeah. Okay. Um, I actually, I was part of the whole surfer scene. I grew up in Florida on the East Coast. <laughs> and yes, I used to, I used to go surfing. I used to be part of the whole skater, uh, punk rock crowd, <laughs> um, you know, got a nose ring, wore combat boots. I bleached my hair platinum blonde. I have pictures to prove it. I was into the whole scene. I would have never guessed that. Although I do see you playing the acoustic guitar every now and then. So maybe. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. No, but I was never good at surfing. I, I was horrible. at My sister was much better than I was. But yeah. But yeah, I was part of the whole scene. So but yeah, let's let's go ahead and talk about this wonderful book that you wrote, Consecration of St. Joseph. First of all, what inspired you to write this? Why St. Joseph in particular? Yeah, a lot of people have asked that. So I've been a priest coming up on 20 years in a few months and about maybe six years ago, um, I just had so many people coming up to me with crises of one kind or another, especially family crises. So women were like, father, my marriage, my husband, he doesn't like that I'm so churchy, that I'm always talking about Jesus. And our children are struggling with their you know, identity and all these other issues. And I just, you know, I was like, well, what do I do? I mean, I, the greatest thing I can do as a priest is say mass and hear confessions, of course, but that's at church. You know, I almost felt like I needed to give people homework. Like your problems are domestic. You need to go home and do something as a family. And that's when the inspiration came to create something like a consecration to Mary, right? Like St. Louis de Montfort's, which has just done so much good. But for St. Joseph, because a lot of what I was hearing about these crises seemed to be really revolving around a father wound, uh, a, a lack of a father in somebody's life, a bad husband or something like that. And and so I thought, boy, now's the time for St. Joseph. And so, yeah, that's where the inspiration came from. And then I set out, took me three years to to put it all together. And what was that process like? Because um, with any good work, any work that's authentically from God, we know that obstacles come, and we also know that there can be spiritual attacks. So were there any obstacles or difficulties in putting this book together? <laughs> you don't even know. It was. I have never, in my years as a Catholic, I've been Catholic now for 30 years, it was intense, and some things are just going to be between me and God, I, you know, but it was, it was unbelievable. You know, you expect the attacks from outside in the world, but a lot of this stuff had to deal with you know, church issues and, and stuff going on in the church. And so that was a surprise to me. And um, it was not easy to to bear that and to carry that and to suffer through that. But maybe that's part of what made the book so fruitful is the suffering that went into it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was it was intense, Christine, it really was. And um, God knows everything that went on. When you say church things, do you mean that there were individuals in the church that tried to block this? 
Yeah, 100%. Oh, wow. Interesting. Well, I, I mean, I, I guess I can kind of see why, because the fruits of, the, of this book have been incredible. I mean, how many languages has it been translated into now? Uh, 22 right now, and it's currently being done in Tagalog. So Amazing. Wow. And, and so what was the reaction? I mean, I'm sure you must have heard from people in, in response to this book. Oh, it's incredible. Like the, the responses are, I mean, from healings, there've been physical healings, which is great. You know, those, those can happen, but the spiritual healings, especially for women, it tends to be that they've, you know, really have received a healing, um, from a, like a, a masculine wound, a man, somebody in their life that hurt them emotionally, physically, God forbid, sexually, that they've now understand that, you know, they don't have to condemn all manhood because of that wound. They don't have to go um, and just kind of be in hatred of the masculine. Now they've got St. Joseph. So for ladies, that's been so true. For men, oh my goodness, so many men around the world in different cultures have told me, Father, I have struggled with pornography, with sins of the flesh, lust, falling into mortal sin every week. And I've tried everything. I've done programs. I've done this. I've done that. And nothing, Father, has broken the chains, chains and, and set me free from this bondage until I did the consecration. And I hear this, I, no joke, pretty much every week somebody sends me an email of that kind. And it's just awesome. Wow. That's amazing. No, you make, you make a great point about, um, I want to talk about the women and then also the men, but uh, St. Joseph, turning to St. Joseph and healing this masculine wound, maybe this father wound. Because I do know in my own life, first I consecrated myself to Mary. That completely changed my life. And she became the mother that I never really had. And having her in my life has really healed me of many things that I needed with regard to a mother. But I never really thought about the, the father aspect of it until I consecrated myself to St. Joseph and started realizing, wow, there you need both. You need both. And there are a lot of people who are missing that masculine aspect in their lives. And I also have heard of a number of cases of deeply traumatized men. Maybe they were abused in their youth or experienced other kind of trauma turning to St. Joseph and really being healed and, and helped by him. I've heard that too. And, you know, a lot of guys who have suffered from abuse and have then turned to things like pornography and just acting out, a lot of that can be also homosexual in nature. So if they're abused at a young age, then they start acting out that. St. Joseph has come through for them too in that particular cross in a huge way. A lot of guys, you know, this isn't something that I struggled with in the past. I was very much, you know, heterosexual and those were my particular weaknesses and faults. And thanks to St. Joseph, I've received so much healing um, as well. But for men who have, you know, had that same sex attraction and acted out on that stuff, St. Joseph has really come through strong for them to kind of reshape their understanding of what a true man is, what a good man is. And, uh, and I rejoice in that too. Praise God. Yeah. So let's talk about that because he is the model of authentic masculinity. And you talk about that in your book. How can he model authentic manhood for men today? Right. Yeah. I think today, like there's, you know, extremes that have got to be avoided because Obviously, you don't want the the effeminate man as the model, which so often happens today. I mean, with the gender confusion, you got men trying to use women's bathrooms and and all that stuff. So, you know, one direction takes it that men have to be soft and just be expressing their emotions constantly. That's actually not real manhood. He has to, yes, you know, be in charge of his emotions and express those emotions and be affectionate. Absolutely. But then on the other spectrum is you have the guy who's the machismo and, you know, woman to make me breakfast. And he's just, you know, really using his strength um, in the wrong way. I think with St. Joseph, we see that virtue of he is tender. He is compassionate. He is affectionate. He is loving. He is kind. But he's also strong. He can swing an axe. He can carry wood and stone. He can walk, you know, to different countries with his family. He, he can do these things. And in that manhood, his family finds rest. You know, his wife, Our Lady, her femininity rested in the strength of her man. Um, Joseph was her man. And yeah, they never engaged in conjugal act, of course, but their love of their hearts was so intense that Our Lady's femininity found 
comfort and security in his manhood. And that's what I see in so many women today. They're very insecure. So many. They could be married and they still wonder, does he love me? Does he really love me? Because there's a wound there. Mary didn't have that kind of stuff because of Joseph. And Jesus, this is amazing what I'm about to say. Jesus, God, wanted to be like Joseph. He wanted to imitate him. He wanted to work like him, walk like him, talk like him. Just incredible to think about. So when you look to St. Joseph, no matter what your vocation in life is, married, religious vocation, priesthood, single, we can all look to St. Joseph um, for comfort, for strength, and for a model of what a true man is. That was one of the things that really struck me when I was reading your book, of what you just said about our Lord, you know, as a little baby, as a toddler, as a young boy, turning to St. Joseph to learn how to be a man. I mean, obviously we know God, was, you know, he's divine, so he's he knows all, but in his human nature, he still had to learn the way that any of us have to learn in our human nature, how to talk and how to eat and how to, you know, all of that stuff. And who would he learn manhood from than his own father, just like any son does? He, he would adopt his gait. He would probably, you know, adopt the same accent when he's speaking. I mean, all these things I, I never thought about until I read your book. And they're just so amazing, so beautiful to think about. Yeah, it really is. And I wish I could say that I was the originator of those ideas. I'm not. I, I just I'm a really good plagiarist with the saints. You know? <laughs> I just take their ideas and kind of consolidate it into something. And but it's so true to think about the greatness of St. Joseph. If, if God wants to imitate you, you must be pretty awesome. <laughs> so um, God doesn't want to imitate me or you or any of our listeners here or the angels. But he wanted to imitate and be like Joseph in his human growth and development. And that's extraordinary. It really is. Now, there's a debate about old versus young St. Joseph. I know Archbishop Fulton Sheen felt very strongly about this. You know, he believed that St. Joseph would have been young when he married Our Lady. But we often see in many depictions of St. Joseph as he's very old. What do you say? Yeah, I think he was younger than he's been depicted for sure. He probably wasn't the same age as Our Lady, but he wasn't like her grandfather either. You know, some of these depictions, he's so old. Um, and there's no definitive church teaching on it. You won't find it um, nailed down in an encyclical or a catechism or anything. Although I have to say, after my book came out, I discovered a talk by Dr. Brant Petrie, great theologian, um, who unpacks it biblically in the Greek and says that we can actually know an age bracket from the New Testament, so divine revelation, of how old he was. And he breaks it down. We don't have time for that here now, but it's really fascinating stuff. And I'm like, oh, man, I wish my book had come out just like six months mm -hmm. later. I could have put his insights in there. But I think people like Venerable Fulton Sheen um, and many others are onto something when they say that he was probably younger. Because, you know, all those depictions of him being old whether in art or icons, statues, or your, your Christmas cards, those come from apocryphal texts, non-approved, non-inspired writings. Sometimes they have interesting insights, but um, they're not scripture. And so those are people just trying to fill in the gaps and, and, and figure things out. God bless them. But um, I don't know. I, I lean towards him being younger, for sure. You know, he worked in the trade of carpentry, and it's it, back then, it wasn't like the way it is today where you have these this heavy machinery that can lift everything for you. I mean, you had to you had to haul the wood, you know, and, and you know, I mean, he's dealing with with a lot of very heavy materials. He'd have to be somewhat strong to do. that. Absolutely. For sure. And, you know, they also say that um, and what would you call them? Not geologists, but people who study the, the cultural time back then in Nazareth, not far from Nazareth, there was a rock quarry that he most likely would have also been involved in. And so carrying stones back to the home to chisel them away and do projects and then walking, you know, to Egypt, super long. And then the Jewish religion, he and Jesus, um, all able-bodied men were required to go to Jerusalem three times a year for the festivities. I mean, from Nazareth, that's a three days walk. So yeah, he probably was a lot younger than we think. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, just going back to this uh, St. Joseph healing people of trauma, I know of one case, an individual that I interviewed some years ago, his name was David, and he was actually very deep in the homosexual lifestyle. In fact, he said he was he was addicted to it 
in, in the worst ways. Even his gay friends were telling him, you, you need help. You know, it was, it was that bad. He was in it for 30 years. And he, he couldn't get out. He could not get out no matter what. He was just a slave to that, that addiction, that sin. And he said he was passing by a Catholic church one day. He went inside. He knelt before a statue of St. Joseph, and he just cried out to him and said, St. Joseph, fix this. I can't do it. You f- fix this. And he did. He did. He got him out of that lifestyle. He got him plugged in with a great Catholic men's group. He started getting counseling. Uh, the homosexuality actually started going away. He started, uh, you know, um, recapturing uh, an attraction to women. So, I mean, St. Joseph did all sorts of amazing things in his life. And I know of other cases, too, where he's done the same for individuals kind of trapped in that lifestyle. So it's an amazing thing. I want to um, read a, an excerpt from your book here. It says, St. Joseph is the most Marian of all saints. His love for Mary is greater than that of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Louis de Montfort, St. Alphonsus Liguri, St. Maximilian Colby, and St. John Paul II combined. There's never been a greater Marian saint than St. Joseph, and there never will be. That was another point that really um, struck me. I'd, I'd never thought about that because you read the works of St. Um, any of the saints you named, St. Bernard or um, you know, Louis de Montfort, any of them, and clearly they had a deep love and devotion for Our Lady. So you kind of think of them as the great Marian saints. You never think of St. Joseph, though, you know, as, as like the greatest Marian saint. I know. It's true. Even myself, I mean, until I really went to prayer with this book, putting it together, did that really dawn on me too? Because, you know, I, I would think St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Colby, those big giant names. And yet, St. Joseph is the one that all those guys really wanted to be like. I mean, he had the privilege of living with Our Lady for, you know, 30 years and and for just being so daily in her presence. And he's the first one that would call her Our Lady. You know, he would say, my lady. Um, He was like a knight for her. And that is extraordinary because he really is the model for Marian consecration. You know, even... At the foot of the cross, when Jesus gives Mary to all Christians, John, the apostle representing all of us, he says, it says, and he took her into his home. Well, Joseph had already done that. <laughs> he, he, he built a home for her. I mean, it's, you can't get more Marian than St. Joseph. And so I think that's a real eye-opening thing for everybody who's read it, because it certainly was for me too, when I was researching it. I want to also read another excerpt because, you know, we're, we were talking earlier about sort of this lack of authentic masculinity today, and there really is a crisis of manhood, and that's something that Michael Voris talks about a lot. He's been talking about that for, you know, more than a decade at Church Militant, this crisis of manhood in families, but also in the church, in which we see sort of weak shepherds, weak priests, who are not really being spiritual fathers to us, and obviously St. Joseph can be a real remedy for that. In, uh, in, for day 10 of your consecration, you have light of patriarchs. Right here, the word patriarch means father, what all the patriarchs of the Old Testament foreshadowed and all Christian fathers are called to reflect is the paternal light of God shining through the fatherhood of St. Joseph. After Christ, St. Joseph is the greatest of all the patriarchs. He is the greatest of all fathers. Do you think that men who consecrate themselves to St. Joseph would, would become better fathers and better priests? For doing so without a doubt and i've and i've heard that from men who are married and have a family and from brother priest um and i think that's really i mean there is something here that we so need to be taking this to the next level because when you have a a, a manhood no matter what your vocation is that's patterned off of saint joseph you become that protector that provider and you want to live those titles that St. Joseph has, right? He's the, the guardian of virgins, not the abuser of the feminine mystery. He's the pillar of families. He's the glory of domestic life. He's the terror of demons. I mean, wouldn't it be great if little Johnny, you know, could say to his dad one day in class, describing his dad to the class, my dad is the glory of our home. My dad is the pillar of our families. My dad is the terror of demons. And wouldn't it be great if priests that you could look at them and say, I'll follow this guy because yes, he's loving, he's compassionate, he's merciful, but he's a man of the truth. He calls out the wolves. We know that under his cloak, under his care, we're going to be shepherded. He's going to lay down his life for us out of service. Man, we need a revolution of that understanding in, in 
the church today in every vocation, especially among the hierarchy, to, to not be afraid to be a man. If you tick some people off, if you offend people, so be it. You know, man up and 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 fight and and call things out and be a protector, um, like Saint Joseph was. You know, he would have protected Our Lady and and the Divine Child as they were going to Egypt. If there were bandits or marauders on those, you know, byways going through the desert, he's not going to just stand there and you know dialogue about it. He's going to do something about it. Um, and you actually get those indications in certain writings of the mystics. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich talks about that. At one point, they were surrounded by robbers and, and bandits. And St. Joseph was basically willing to throw down. So this is what we've got to look to, I think, in, in our vocations, no matter what vocation we as men have. And that's something I really appreciate about you, Father, is, uh, you know, you, you don't hold back. I mean, you always, you always demonstrate charity and patience, but you don't water things down. You don't dilute things. I mean, you, you, you are a true priest, and that's something I've always appreciated about you. But let's, you mentioned one of his titles, Terror of Demons. That was something else. That's a wonderful title, by the way. I love that. But a lot of people don't think about him in that sense. Why is he the Terror of Demons? Yeah. You know, it's funny. When I was putting the book together, I had heard that title, so I knew about it. But when I shared it with some others, even a few priests, they were like, oh, no, don't call them that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's in the litany. It's not. I'm not winging it here. I'm not making this up. It's what the church says. I think, you know, as I've thought about that, there's two main reasons that he's called the terror of demons. One is his purity, because if you're not pure, you're spiritually impotent. You don't have power. It's only the pure who have power. And the devil is terrified of purity. So St. Joseph, he's got that most chaste heart. And that lily that he holds, you know, far too long have we seen that lily, you know, making him soft and sometimes even effeminate in the images that we see of him, or like the cane of an old man, like it's holding him up. No, that's the spear of a spiritual warrior. That's a lance that pierces the filthy pornographic craziness of the devil. So his purity is a terror to the devil. And then secondly is his paternity, which, I mean, he commands God. So in the life of the Holy Family, when, you know, Joseph said something, God and the divine person of Jesus did it. He obeyed him. And that's extraordinary. God doesn't obey creatures, but he did this particular one and Our Lady as well, of course. So that paternity um, has power that the devil knows that he doesn't want people to be aware of. So in a certain sense, as I say in the book, I didn't know how to phrase this, but I said basically... The devil has kind of delighted um, in people not being aware of the paternal intercession of St. Joseph, because just like Our Lady, when Our Lady says they have no wine, all of a sudden you're going to have a ton of wine because Jesus loves his mom. So when Joseph presents a need to his divine son, even now in heaven, consider it done. I mean, Jesus loves his dad, his, his earthly father, his virginal father. So the devil knows that, and he doesn't want you to know it. Because then you've got, you know, access to all the treasures of heaven through the paternity of St. Joseph. So I think those are the main reasons. Absolutely. Now, um, do you have any current projects related to this that you're able to talk about? Yeah, I do. Um, I wish I could show you like the cover. So right now it's finished. It's at the printers. Um, it's a graphic novel, something I never thought I'd be doing. It's basically a, a comic book, but it's for adults too. It's not just for children. It's titled The Chaste Heart of St. Joseph, but it goes through in a, in a cartoon way and really unpacks the theology, all the devotion, the saints, the what the popes have said, the apparitions St. Joseph has appeared in, shrines dedicated to him, miracles, all that good stuff in about 70 pages. And I didn't do the illustrations. Oh, no way. I, we wouldn't sell one copy. I can't even draw a stick figure. But the gentleman who did is off the charts. His ability to draw these things is mind-blowing. So I did all the, the the writing for it and everything. So that'll be coming out in June, uh, The Chaste Heart of St. Joseph. It's going to be awesome. So when you say comic, is this primarily for children or can adults read it as well? Yeah, it's for adults as well because it contains some very deep theology, but in a way that's simple. So it's it's for everyone. Excellent. I can't wait for this book to get it, come out. I'm going to order it and I'm going to have myself and all my children read it. But where can people go to learn more about you, order your books, including Consecration of St. Joseph? 
Yeah. So my religious community, the Marian Fathers, they set up a website just for all the St. Joseph stuff. So that's consecration to stjoseph.org. Um, it's got everything there dealing with St. Joseph. And then for myself, uh, I'm the vocation director for my religious community. So you can see what events I'm speaking at, the pilgrimages that I lead. Um, we have a website for myself, too, that my religious community set up. It's just fathercalloway.com, either one of those. Excellent. Thank you so much, Father. Again, I really appreciate your ministry. Everyone out there, here's the book right here, holding it up. Go out, order it, read it. Don't put it off. I know I have friends who, who are like, oh, I'll get to it. No, get to it now. <laughs> uh, it will change your life. It's absolutely wonderful. Father, thank you so much for joining me. Again, honored to have you on and keep up the great work. Thanks, Christine. You too. God bless you. God bless. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. You can always write me at forwardboldly at churchmilton.com with your tips, suggestions, feedback, questions. I love to hear from you. Again, go out, get this book. You will love St. Joseph even more than you already do. So, all right. In the words of St. Joan of Arc, in God's name, forward boldly. <laughs>